Well, Mike Geiger, the president and CEO of the Auspicious Association of Fundraising Professionals, Mike, I quote AFP, like, I swear to God, once a week um, from the wonderful missives that you send out to the information, the research that your organization does. Um, you really are the leading thought organization, I think, for our sector. And so we are super, super excited to have you join us today. And um, I can't wait to delve into this. Now, we were able to find a picture of you holding up your fingers Three And so we came up with the top three things that fundraisers face. But I think we're going to hear a lot more than just three things. Yeah. <laughs> so we're super excited to have you with us. We're also super excited to have Wendy F. Adams, one of our intrepid co-host panelists. And she is also a CFRE and somebody who is really a part of the AFP family as well in her workaday world. And so, Wendy, thank you for joining us. We're also incredibly honored to have the support of our presenting sponsors, most who have been with us since day one, when we started now more than five years ago and more than a thousand episodes ago. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy, National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Okay, Mike Geiger, what the heck? MBA and CPA? What were you hmm. bored in school? I, I was overachiever. I was bored. <laughs> I was bored one weekend. What can I say? I, I, you know, you know what's interesting about about at least my career, and maybe it's for other people, and maybe if you look back on yours, you would agree with me. Things just sort of happen. I mean, you have a plan, mm -hmm. and and you're sort of going in that general plan, but but then something comes up and, and you take a little detour, you go a little bit this way, a little bit that way. And, and I wasn't, I wasn't planning on, on getting my MBA, but, but then, then I did. And, and I had no thought I was done with that. And I'm like, okay, no more. I'm, I'm, I am tired of looking at books. And then I realized, well, there's an opportunity to get my CPA. And, and then I did that. And, and then from there, I've, I've just been in, in nonprofits all my career. Mm -hmm. So it's just, I want to say it was sort of accidental, but I mean, it wasn't, but it, but it wasn't a master plan. Let's put it that way. You know, I love that because I think there are a lot of people in our sector who would have a similar story. You know, they didn't plan on going into the nonprofit uh, service air arena, and then they find that they, they love it or they have a passion for something. And then before they know it, it's just bloomed. And I mean, Wendy, don't you see that as well? I I do. I see like we we we're starting to walk this path and then oh, it also speaks to holding things loosely and being ready to be flexed, yes. right? So that's what I'm hearing from you, Mike. No, that's that's exactly right. Being being open, having an open mindset, a growth mm -hmm. mindset and yeah. and when there's opportunities that that fit into what your life ethos is then then you take those and and you never know where they go sort of that that That's road right. less traveled and yeah. if you take it lots of opportunities open up that you never thought you never even thought about i love it i love the spirit of that well with the spirit of that mike talk to us about what afp does and why we should be paying attention to them and to you and your team uh how does this impact our sector yeah. So, so I'm, I'm the, the president and CEO, as you mentioned, so I am not biased in any way at all. I have the absolute greatest staff working with me, with me, I emphasize with, um, we have incredible volunteers. We have incredible board members. We've, the organization was founded in 1960, uh, really based on the, the premise of, of our code of ethics, to provide an ethical framework for fundraisers back in in 1960, and it has it has taken off from there. We're almost 30,000 members, and we are we are shared, split out, um, approximately 200 chapters, and and we have we have uh, about 20 collegiate chapters. So we we really try to to mm -hmm. serve our members through the chapter model. Mm -hmm. And and I think that makes us unique from a lot of other organizations where there's 
I mean, yes, we are, we are <clears throat> here at the headquarters, we are the AFP Global, sort of the umbrella, but then we have all the chapters that really are the connection point to, mm -hmm. to our members. And, and so what we do is we provide education on best practices. Uh, we, we, we focus on uh, how do we improve the skills that our members have in the fundraising area, but also in other areas, because nowadays you're not just a fundraiser. Right. You're you're a fundraiser. You're a, a finance person. You're an HR person. You're into relationships. You're you know, there's so many other parts of your job than just being the fundraiser. Then we also bring our members together. So we are a convener. We have and we'll probably talk about this a little bit later. Uh, we have Icon every year, which brings together, you know, three thirty five hundred to forty five hundred individuals in one location we were just in toronto and and it was again i'm biased it was incredible um we 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 also focus very heavily on our code of ethics making sure that we create a framework that we have a framework that our members as members of our organization that they feel safe they feel respected they feel valued and and that's a critical critical piece of of what we bring. So I think those three things are really, mm -hmm. really important. What we are, we actually, we just finished a membership survey and, and we were just going over the results yesterday. And, and what we are seeing is that our members are extremely happy, pleased, proud of being an AFP member. Good. And then we dig into, okay, well, if you are a young professional Mm -hmm. versus a more seasoned, you know, what are you looking for? And, and, and in an organization, and we see how we all know those in their twenties and thirties are different than those of us in our fifties mm -hmm. and sixties mm -hmm. and, and they want different things. And so for us, we are trying to, to meet the needs where our members are. We want to go to where they are. I think, I think that we see, we see in our world that, Successful organizations are the organizations that go to where their members are and that are able to, uh, and I'm going to put quotes around it, customize the the member experience so that so that you feel this is truly created for me. And that's different than what that membership experience is for you, Julia, and different than it is for you, Wendy. Yeah. So, so I could go on, but that's sort of that's sort of the the highlights of of what we bring to the table for our members. Well, let's dig down a little bit because one of the things that we always worry about is, and I shouldn't say we always, but we we do talk a lot about this is mm -hmm. the retention of our talent. And you know, this is a big issue for just the the employment landscape mm -hmm. in itself. Yeah. Yep. What are you seeing? In, in terms of professional fundraisers and what can we be doing to retain yeah. our talent? Yeah. So, so the, the, the statistic that is thrown out there a lot is that fundraisers, they job hop a lot. They, they, they move every 18 months, 24 months at the most, they're constantly moving around. And, and I think since COVID, what we are seeing is that that, that, that is, that is changing. It's elongating. Um, fundraisers are staying in their jobs a little longer. And, and I think that, that the biggest challenges we have as fundraisers in, in our role is those, those to whom we report who are not fundraisers, they don't understand what fundraisers do, right? They, yes. they think, oh yeah, I, 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 here, I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this story. I, I was, um, I was a CFO at a very well-known uh, global think tank and and the CEO, we were having we were having a budget meeting, and the CEO said, "Well, we need to raise another two million dollars for for to, to meet the budget. So let's ask the fundraiser to raise another two million dollars. I mean, like like you could just go in and and type it in, and and the money comes out, right? It's it's not how it works. And I and and I think that that the the top leaders of organizations." even though they are typically involved in the fundraising process, they don't understand everything that is involved. You don't just meet someone, mm -hmm. ask them for a donation 
And, and that's that, right? It is a process. It is building the relationship. It is understanding what is it that the donor um, wants to achieve? What is it that the community wants to achieve? And, and we can look at, at donor-centric fundraising and community-centric fundraising as two different approaches that I think work well together, actually. I don't think they are mm -hmm. opposed to each other. So, so retention of staff, I think, is, is a challenge. But I think that the more we can educate the, the rest of the organization as to what's really involved, the, the higher the chances of retaining our fundraisers. I, I think that in an organization, one way or another, every employee is actually a fundraiser, right? There is, there is, there is the person when they pick up the phone to answer an incoming phone call or respond to an email. Like those are touch points that are really important. And when you look at the, the best in class organizations, whether we're talking nonprofit or for profit, every touch point is such a great experience. And, and I think that, that that's going to be an important piece in terms of retention is having, having the rest of the organization support the fundraiser, not just, well, you're the fundraiser, you're out on your own, bring us in all the money. That that just doesn't work, right? And so so I I think that 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 kind of education will help. I actually think that that the the hybrid work environment is is also very helpful um, in retaining employees. I think we have seen that. We started we started after the pandemic three days in the office, and then through various negotiations with staff which I'm always open to, we we agreed on two days in the office. So today is a Tuesday and we are here Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Um, so I think there's these different these different uh, benefits that are, mm -hmm. are non-financial that, that can help retain. I also think that the compensation has increased significantly. When you look at AFP's compensation study that comes out every year, and, and if you don't have it, you really should go find it, it shows that compensation has increased and it has increased across all the different um, all, all the different aspects of employees, whether they are male, female, black, white, Asian, whether they are members of the LGBTQ uh, community. And, and so I think that the increase in compensation is another piece that helps. So I think that these are these are the financial aspects and the non-financial aspects that organizations can lean into to to retain their employees. I love it. You know, Wendy, one of the things that you and I have seen and we and we've actually spoken about, um, there's so much information that comes at us, right? So yes. much. Everybody's, you yeah. know, trying to to be more uh, data oriented. <clears throat> And we get these mixed messages about this de this concerning decline of fundraising, and you know people aren't giving, and we have all these new instruments from DAFs mm -hmm. to. Yep. What do you see, Mike? What are your What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, we we do. Uh, so AFP has a foundation, the AFP Foundation for Philanthropy, and the foundation. Uh, does a lot of does all of our research, and so as part of the foundation, we have a we have a an initiative called the Fundraising Effectiveness Project, FEP, and and we are cons we are constantly doing research on on different metrics, mm -hmm. and so what we are seeing is that over the past year, there has been a three percent drop in dollars raised. There's been a little more than a 3% drop in donors, and there's been about a 2.5% drop in donor retention. So this, this is a trend that we've been seeing since 2022 coming out of the pandemic. And, and then we have inflation that has also impacted this, right? So, so our numbers, they get even, even less optimistic if we include the, the impact of inflation. So the key thing is that in prior years, we would be able to maintain the level of giving in dollars because there were there were the 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 very wealthy donors that stepped up. The markets, yeah. the stock market had been increasing, and so they actually had more money to give, and so they gave more. And so it sort of hid it hid the the decline in in donors and especially in smaller donors. 
-hmm. Yeah, we hit that perfect storm, right? Everything right. at the same. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Yep. yep. And and I think that I think that um I th I think there's there's good news ahead. And and I'm and I'm gonna point us to the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at mm -hmm. Indiana University. Amir Pasek heads that up. And they're predicting a return to growth in the coming years. They do a philanthropy outlook for 2024 and for 2025. And they predict that giving will increase this year by 4.2%. And then in 2025, by 3.9%. Now, inflation has been coming down, so that's helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, we're coming we're coming out of, we are out of, I, I never know what the right term is, but but the pandemic, I think, for most of us, at least in our mindset, is, is mm -hmm. behind us. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that everybody is feeling a little better about, about giving and... and um, what they can do, how they can bring about change. There's one thing that's going to be very interesting this year, and we see it every four years, and that's the presidential election. A lot of giving goes to that, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it takes up all the oxygen, not all the oxygen, it takes up a lot of the oxygen in the room and and funnels money that, that could be used for, for other things, Mm -hmm. And funnels it into that. And, and so we're going to be we're going to be dealing with that. But there's also opportunity. There's also opportunity. And one of the big opportunities are looking at millennials and Gen Z. We really expect that they're going to be playing a larger and larger role in philanthropy as they begin to inherit mm -hmm. wealth from their parents slash grandparents, depending on, on all the different situations. And, and we have to learn, and this is where AFP comes in, we have to learn how to fundraise, how to connect, how to build relationships mm -hmm. with those generations, because it's very different than my generation, different. right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's an entirely different way of thinking. My, my daughter is, is uh, what is today? She's 10-ish 10, 10 10 -ish days away from being 25, mm -hmm. and, and she has a very different approach on, on things. And and so we have to make sure we understand how do we how do we connect now. One of the many ways to connect is is also artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. and and we can like that's a whole show on itself, right? I mean, that's I, a whole I, month. <laughs> it really is, right? I, I pulled up our latest um, AFP's mm -hmm. advancing philanthropy, and we did a whole issue on on AI and and how to how to really benefit from that. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love that you're talking about that. And I love that you're pointing us. I mean, as as thought leaders to our sector, um, and I have to say, I'm a total groupie for your uh, the e-newsletter the e that comes out where you yeah. have your comments and you talk about things that, are, that you're witnessing and that's going on. Um, I, I think it's very insightful and I think it's inspirational. And it's also gives me a glimpse into a different way of thinking at times. But you have this comment about collective wisdom mm -hmm. and how we search for it. What does that mean to you and what should it mean to us? Collective wisdom is, I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers. Wendy, all due respect, you may have all the answers. But but together, together we can yes. we can we can learn from each other. We can challenge each other respectfully, right? That's that's a really important word. I, I, social media is is good in many ways, but but it uh, it it also mm -hmm. can wind up being very disrespectful. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that bringing people together, bringing ideas together, uh, throwing up ideas, learning from each other, not assuming that that the typical people have all the answers, but let's go talk to other people. Let's bring other people into the conversations. Who typically are have not, who typically mm -hmm. have not been been in these conversations. I learn so much more from talking to people that that when when we go to Icon um, or and, and it's in Seattle next year, plug, plug, um, <laughs> or we go to Lead, which is in St. Louis in October, plug, plug. Um, when when I get that chance to meet with people that I don't normally cross paths mm -hmm. with, just mm -hmm. they live in a different part of the country, they they do different kind of work, 
And to have that chance to sit down and talk and learn and question, and not I don't mean question them, but but question the different ideas that we're talking about. Be curious. I think, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's inspiring, right? In in my previous roles when I worked for for uh, large global think tanks and I would travel around the world for different meetings or different initiatives, having the chance to sit down with people that that are very different from me. Mm -hmm. That's where we grow as people. That's where we that's where we learn. And so as an organization, AFP tries to bring together people from very diverse backgrounds, people that think very differently and and bring us together and talk about things. I mean, there's so many critical things from the metrics, but but even more important than that, the the work we're doing around idea, inclusion, mm -hmm. diversity, equity, and access, right? That's something that we all have to get behind to really have the impact that that we want to have. And and having those conversations, you can only do that when we are together. You don't do it on social media. You, you, it just, it doesn't work, right? Somebody throws a bomb out there and runs away. Mm. It's, it's, it's just terrible, but it, it has its purpose and, and that's okay. But our, our, we view our role as how do we bring people together, share different ideas, challenge different ideas, come up with new ideas, new ways of doing things, and, and looking at how do we reach out into the corners and the sidelines and the end zones and the center of the field and bring everybody together. And, and I think that's the, for me, what collective wisdom is, is really all about. I love Fantastic. It. Yeah. What do you <laughs> yeah, think, Wendy? I mean, yeah, Wendy, what do you think about that? I mean, are you seeing that in your practice and where you are in this country? I am. I definitely am. I mean, no two visions, no two missions are the same. So why do we think that we've got the answer right here, you know, in, in, in our little sector or our little corner of the world? We do. We talk about being better together. We say it. Now it's time to walk it out. I love that whole, the, like you said, the collective mindset and recognizing mm -hmm. being curious, right? Yes. Not assuming, yes. Still working on that here, but really yeah. asking the question without an assumption um, yeah. that, hey, we really do need each other in that space. So I love that. Love it. Yeah. And I'm I'm experiencing that as a member of AFB and a CFRE. I see that we are as an organization walking that out. I'm so proud. Yeah, you just you just hit on two things that that I that I always carry with me. One is the the assume, right? We know what happens when you assume, right? You know, yes, I, indeed. I don't, I don't remember the origin of that. I think it was a, a show or something. But and, and then the curiosity, right? I you know, mm -hmm. if if anybody wants that 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 explanation of curiosity, go to that Ted Lasso episode mm. where he's throwing darts in the pub, right? And and he talks about, you know, you, you were never curious about who I was as he just cleans up the 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 dart game and and it's really it is that right it's about mm -hmm. being curious and and not going into things which is really hard not yes, going into things is. with our own biases right they're whether yeah. they're unconscious or mm -hmm. whether they are conscious it's it's trying to put those behind us and mm -hmm. be open-minded and say, I don't know everything let, let me learn and and maybe what I think is actually not right challenge our own assumptions. Right, right. And it starts with the leader. It starts with the leader when they can show that they can do that. Yeah, man. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, Mike Geiger, what a leader. And like I yeah. said today, and I really, I was kind of teasing you, but I, I really meant it. You are a big fish, um, you know, not only for the nonprofit show, but for uh, our, our, our sector and really for the mm -hmm. world. I mean, um, you know, North America does fundraising like nobody else. It's a big part of our culture and our, mm -hmm. our history and our future. And so to have your organization come on and, and share with us and at the same time, be so strong and be such a great thought leader uh, for the, the amazing uh, numbers of people doing this work. Um, I really applaud you. And I have to say, when I put out to the co-host panel, we were going to have you on. Um, there were a lot of co-hosts that wanted to come on, and Wendy was the lucky one <laughs> that got to, to be here. Well, I'm, I'm, flattery will get you everywhere. So <laughs> just, just keep it coming. Keep it coming. Right? It's but a privilege no, for sure. In, in seriousness, you know, I, I 
I, I love having the opportunity to talk to people and, and share the vision of the organization. It's such yeah. an incredible organization mm -hmm. and, and I'm honored and, and privileged. I've been in this role seven years and, and it's, it's been, it's been an amazing journey um, so far. And, and I, I really am blessed to, to be in this role. So I, I've, cherish i value the opportunities to to talk to people about things that i'm seeing i love it well we Fantastic. are delighted that you would be here mike geiger president and ceo ceo of afp the association of fundraising professionals mm. check out afpglobal.org you will be amazed at how much information yeah it is it is the the head the mind blow on that because the amount mm -hmm. of information that AFP Global gives out to the sector is remarkable. It's always changing. Yes. It's always fresh. It has a forward th uh, thinking uh, perspective as well as a historical context so mm -hmm. that you can mm -hmm. kind of see the journey and the arc of, of things that are happening, which I think is super important. Um, and finally, Mike, we found something that was started before I was born. <laughs> usually these things are always like after I was born. So that made my day, Mike. I just got to say. There you go. There you go. <laughs> no, it's it's great. I mean, I'm, you know, as an organization, we're really proud of the work that we do. We're honored to serve our members. We have an incredible staff. We have incredible volunteers and contributors to all our work. Nobody is on this journey alone. And, and we are, we're just grateful to be a part of all the work that we are all trying, we collectively as a sector are trying to achieve. So yeah. thank you very much for the opportunity today. Oh my Fantastic. gosh. It, it's been amazing. Hey, Miss Wendy, I'm going to let you take us out today because I have done all the talking today. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, so exciting. Thank you, Mike. Once again, none of this is possible without our tremendous sponsors. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and JMT Consulting. Thank you so much. They are amazing parts they of are. the sector, and uh, we are so honored. You know, Mike, we sign off every day with the same mantra, and we started it Back five years ago, that first weekend of the pandemic um, mm -hmm. shut down with this this mantra, and it means something different to me every day. And I always say that because it sounds, it, it's like a broken record, but it's really true. And I loved so many of the things that you said today. So many of the things were hopeful, they were strategic, and they were they were concrete in that we need to be working together. And so the message goes like this: to stay well. So you can do well. We'll see you back here for another episode of the Nonprofit Show. Thank you, you two, very, very much.